Hey everybody, welcome back to another Grain to Glass video. Today we are going to be tackling a great style for the 4th of July, and I'm going to be kicking off a series. So, don't go anywhere, grab a drink, let's make some beer. It's your first time here, I just want to say welcome on this channel. I'll typically do a grain to glass video like this one where I take a beer all the way from start to finish and you get to see every part of that process. And I also will do other shorter, more informative videos as well. So if you like that kind of thing, please go ahead, hit the subscribe button and check out my channel page for the rest of my content. Today we're going to be tackling a German Pilsner, which is a really good style, I think. It's a really cool style. I've done one before on the channel already and it was pretty good, but I think I'm going to go ahead and revisit it to launch off this series I'm talking about. So we are going to be doing a Pilsner series on this channel. Pilsners are probably one of my favorite kinds of beer in general. And they've actually kind of been overlooked in years past, but I think they're starting to make a little bit of a comeback now. Not too long ago, I brewed the light pseudo lager that's in this glass here. Um, and that kind of got me thinking, I really enjoy Pilsners, and I don't think I make them nearly enough, so I thought I would go ahead and brew a bunch of different Pilsners. By the way, if you like the glassware, and you want to pick up one for yourself, go ahead and check out the merch store that's in the description box. You can buy these yourself. Uh, so what we're going to do is brew through five different styles of Pilsner, uh, starting with the venerable German Pilsner. They're very delicate styles, they're very intricate styles, and um, I think they're really fascinating. And I think it'd be really cool to just kind of line them all up next to each other and just kind of see what the individual differences between each type of Pilsner are. So we'll start with this German Pilsner here, and then we'll move to a Czech Pilsner. Then we'll do an American Pilsner, which is also known as the Pre-Prohibition Pilsner, using some six-row malt and some stuff like that. Then we're going to go ahead and do two of the newer varieties that have popped up in the last couple of years, Italian Pilsner and New Zealand Pilsner. So both, all of these should provide some very interesting brewing challenges, but I hope by the end of the series both you and I have learned a decent amount about Pilsners, and I'm kind of hoping we get a new kind of appreciation for the style out of it. One of the reasons why I also wanted to make this series was because I really kind of want to put my brewing skills to the test. Pilsners are delicate, careful beers, and it's easy to make a good Pilsner because they're very simple. However, it's very difficult to make a great Pilsner. And that is the real challenge. Any sort of brewing mistakes will really manifest themselves in a beer like this and any uh, off flavors will be very noticeable and very easy to pick out. So it is, it's going to be a bit of a challenge and I think it's going to be a lot of fun to see how this goes. Uh, so we're going to start with a German Pilsner and uh, we'll find out how this one goes. All of these Pilsners we're going to be using traditional lager yeasts for and probably we'll be exploring a bunch of different lagering methods. So you might see things like pressure fermentation, gelatin finings versus traditional lagering, and also maybe some high temperature lager fermentations. But if you don't want to go through the pain of a traditional lagering process and you just want to use ale yeast and make a pseudo lager, I would highly recommend using something like Lutra Quark, which is the yeast that I used to make this, uh, this light lager here, or this light pseudo lager if you will. It was finished in three days uh, and it still tastes clean as a whistle. You can check out the video for that beer right up here in the corner. Lutra is a fantastic workaround for any lager yeast or any clean ale yeast in fact and um, I will definitely be using it again just not in the Pilsner series. But anyway today we're gonna do German Pilsner. While German Pilsner is not the oldest version of Pilsner it is I think in my opinion probably one of the easier types of Pilsner to brew. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start with that one. Like I said, not my first time making a German Pils on this channel. However, I think what we're going to do here is try to improve a little bit on the last one and see how it goes. So real quickly, we're going to do a little history on the German Pils. Pilsner as a style actually originated in the town of Pilsen, uh, which is 
in the Czech Republic, but formerly was kind of a German heavy area back before Germany was like an actual thing. The history and the politics of the German area um, over the last like 300 years is kind of complicated and that's not exactly what this channel is about. So uh, to make things simple, basically a brewer from the Bavarian region by the name of Josef Grohl uh, traveled to Pilsen to brew there and their water was extremely soft. So as a result, he was able to brew pale lagers that had very delicate flavors and um, essentially became very, very easy to drink and very popular very fast. This all happened in the late 1800s and uh, quickly the Pilsner style spread throughout the European region. However, Pilsen was really the only town that was able to make a true Czech Pilsner in that super delicate light way because it was the only town that had that soft of water. Most brewers in Germany were working with a lot harder water. So what happened was as the Czech style of Pilsner kind of became popular, many brewers in Germany started brewing their own versions of it and the water was a bit harder and they started using different hops. Czech Pilsners are typically using Saz hops and German Pilsners will typically use the German varieties of like Halletau or Tetnang or Spalt or something like that. So as a result, the German Pilsner kind of evolved into something slightly different than the Czech Pilsner. The German Pilsner had less complexity in its malt character. Um, it had a little bit more bitterness, in fact, uh, and the hops were a bit brighter, a bit uh, sharper, if you will, and the beer was a little bit paler as well. Uh, the Germans really enjoyed their dark lagers a lot more than the light lagers um, up until about after World War II, and then the style became very, very popular after that. So what we are going for is not a Czech Pilsner. It is not a soft water profile. It is not a particularly malty beer. I chose a nice high quality Pilsner malt. And then on top of that, we're gonna really focus on bitterness. We're gonna focus on uh, showcasing the floral and the spicy and the herbal nature of German noble hops and loading a lot of that into the uh, late boil. So hopefully by the end of this whole thing, we have a beer that is extremely crisp, delicate, light, and enjoyable. Hopefully this also has a nice bright amount of hops, but uh, enough bitterness to keep it very interesting, but not so much to the level of the hop forward beers that we're used to today. So we're gonna start out with 10 pounds of Weirman Pilsner malt. This is basically all you need for a Pilsner. Um, but on top of that, I'm choosing to add about half a pound of Carapils, which is exactly why I wore my Genus Brewing t-shirt. Uh, the Carapils is, it's pretty well known for boosting head retention, despite the fact that it's a caramel malt, doesn't really add that much sweetness. But it will add a lot of head retention. Um, I did screw up with my Belgian double and uh, ended up with almost no head retention on it, and I really just kind of want to ensure that that doesn't happen with a Pilsner, because that's just sad. And of course, last but not least, we're going to add two ounces of Weirman acidulated malt, which is going to help bring the mash pH to where it should be, given that this is a very pale beer and we're not adding any sort of alkalinity to the water profile. For hops, I'm going to be using one of my favorite bittering hops of all time, and that is Pearl. Pearl has a fantastic clean character to it, um, and I, I really should use it more in other beers that aren't German, but in German beers it just shines absolutely beautifully. So we're using an ounce and a half of Pearl at 60 minutes to get us about 35 IBUs. And then we're not going to add any hops until the late boil, so we'll wait till about 15 minutes, and then I'm going to add half an ounce each of Haller Tower Mittelfru and Tetnanger. Uh, both of these are German noble hops that should really make a nice herbal, floral, spicy kind of character. And then at zero minutes, we're gonna go ahead and add another half ounce each of Haller Tower Mittelfru and Tetnanger. For yeast, I'm using probably one of my favorite lager yeasts, and that is the Saf Lager W3470 uh, Dry Lager Yeast. It's a workhorse and it makes great beers, but if you want to use the liquid yeast, you can find the same strain in Imperial Global Lager Yeast and uh, Y Yeast 2124 Bohemian Lager. So for the water profile on this one, uh, like I said, it has a little bit more minerality than your typical uh, Chick Pilsner would. That being said, it's still not that much. And what this allows us to do is really tweak the water profile so that we end up with a roughly two to one sulfate to chloride ratio, which makes the beer uh, basically feel more bitter. It makes the hops brighter, it makes them pop. And uh, it also gives us the kind of the idea that the beer is finishing drier than it actually is. And if you're curious about how to make that work in your own water, uh, go ahead and check this video out here. It's going to pop up in the corner. That goes over the basics of water chemistry. It's not very hard to get into, and I think you'll be very happy if you do try it out. So for our water profile, we're going with 39 parts per million of calcium, 6 parts per million of magnesium, 26 parts per million of sodium, 56 parts per million of chloride, 99 parts per million of sulfate, and 0 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that profile, I'm adding the following salts to 8 gallons of distilled water. 
uh, four grams of gypsum, two grams of epsom, two grams of sodium chloride, and one gram of calcium chloride. So for our mash, we're gonna go ahead and actually use a step mash on this one. Uh, you really want this beer to be very dry, uh, so having a highly attenuated beer is pretty important. Uh, so what we're gonna do is do a two-step mash that I used for my Kolsch, which is actually really effective at creating a very nice dry beer with a good finish on it and still not just making it overly watery. So the first step is simply 45 minutes at 145 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we ramp up the temperature to 158 degrees Fahrenheit and hold that step for 45 minutes. Uh, and then after that we mash out. So it's pretty simple and if you don't want to do that that's totally fine just go ahead and do a single infusion mash at about 150 Fahrenheit probably for about 90 minutes as you really do want to ensure you get every bit of conversion out of this beer as possible. I ended up coming home from work a bit early and we're kind of starting this brew day in the late afternoon so if it's a little dark outside when I'm finishing up the brew day you'll know why. But anyway I'm very excited to get this going so let's go ahead and head on over there and dough in. Once the strike water in my claw hammer supply 120 volt system reached my dough in temperature, I doughed in with a grain belt, being sure to break up any clumps or whatever in the mash. Next, I started the recirculation. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes and then I drew a sample for a pH measurement and I saw a measurement of 5.4, which was pleasantly right on target. The acid malt calculations were indeed correct. I let the mash sit at 145 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 minutes and then I raised it to the next step temperature of 158 Fahrenheit. Once we hit that temperature I let it sit there for 30 minutes. Then I raised to the mash out temperature which was 170 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, again once I reached the mash out temperature I let it sit there for about 15 minutes. Then I pulled out the grain basket and I let that drain for about 15 minutes as well. However, as soon as I pulled out the grain basket, I did fire up the controller to 100% power. That gets a jump start on the boil and reduces the amount of time it takes to heat up. I pulled a sample of wort for the pre-boil gravity reading at this point and I recorded a measurement of 11.5 bricks or 1045, which was actually exactly the target pre-boil gravity. Once I reached the boil, I added my 60 minute hop addition, which was about an ounce and a half of pearl. Then I let the boil continue for another 45 minutes. At that point, I added my 15 minute hop addition, half an ounce each of Haller Tower, Mittelfruer, and Tatnanger. I also added a Whirlflock tablet at this time, and I added some yeast nutrient as well. Lastly, I started recirculating boiling wort through my chilling system to sanitize it. Uh, just definitely the easiest way to make sure your chiller is sanitized, just boil it. Once the boil had ended, I took my zero minute hop addition and added that. That was a half an ounce each again of Haller Tower, Mittelfruhe, and Tetnanger. Then I took the entire setup inside where I could hook my chilling system up to the sink and I began chilling. I let the wort chill to about 65 degrees Fahrenheit, then I aerated the wort by splashing it right into the anvil bucket fermenter that I chose for this fermentation. Then I pitched the yeast. I took an OG sample using a hydrometer and I recorded an original gravity of 1046, which was only one point higher than the pre-boil gravity, which makes very little sense. However, what likely happened was that my wort stratified on one of my two gravity readings during this brew, and that happens quite frequently. There are many different ways to ferment the lager, but I'll touch on a couple here. The first method is to do something called pressure fermentation, which is where you ferment it using a traditional lager yeast, but at room temperature. However, you apply about five PSI of pressure to the fermenter, provided that it can accept that. Something like a Firmzilla all-rounder or a stainless steel unitank is the type of equipment you want to do uh, to use for that. Obviously don't use a bucket, don't use a uh, glass carboy or anything like that. Uh, it can't withstand pressure. Pressure fermentation allows the yeast to reap the benefits of faster fermentation from a higher temperature while suppressing the negative off flavors and uh, additional things like fusel alcohols that are produced from fermenting at too high of a temperature for a specific type of yeast. Um, it's a pretty fascinating thing and it actually works pretty well. I've done it a couple times before. The second method you could do is what I mentioned earlier using W3470 yeast 
or 2124 or the Imperial Global Strain at a high temperature. This is still lager yeast, but it has somehow evolved to be able to ferment very cleanly up to almost about 70 degrees which I have also done before and I've had pretty good results with it. In this case, your fermentation will complete very fast, probably about three to five days, um, and it actually helps speed things up quite a bit. And um, even though it does kind of undertake a little bit of risk. However, the third method is what I'm doing while I'm using the same exact yeast strain that I just mentioned, W3470. Uh, what we will be doing is the classic lager fermentation routine. So we will pitch our yeast and then we'll bring our work down to about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to be using the Anvil Bucket Fermenter and the Anvil Cooling System to do this sort of thing on a budget. And it should be actually pretty cool. I have a dorm fridge set up with a cold water reservoir inside of it and a giant ice cube, so that should helpfully keep the temperature at about 50 degrees for about a week. After about a week, we should have about 50% attenuation, and at that point we want to start bringing things up to room temperature for what's called a diacetyl rest, which is where we bring the beer up to about room temperature for about two to three days. That allows the yeast to complete fermentation and clean up any byproducts they produce during fermentation to include diacetyl, which is a gross buttery flavor. After the fermentation phase is complete, which should be about two weeks, we'll take the beer, we'll transfer into a keg, and at that point we will begin the lagering process which is cold storage and clarification. Now you can sort of shortcut this process by using gelatin findings. Uh, I've done this many times before and it helps drop the yeast and sediment down out of the beer and it gives you a very clear beer nice and quickly. However, I again am gonna be going down the traditional route for this beer and using a traditional lager method, which involves taking the beer in its package and leaving it at a near freezing point for a couple weeks, probably about two to three weeks. And at that point, it should be nice and crystal clear. The benefit of this phase, uh, and especially the benefit over using gelatin findings, is that it really does make the beer feel a bit crisper. It really enhances the drinking experience and the mouthfeel. However, the difference between using gelatin and waiting a couple days versus using a traditional lager and waiting two to three weeks um, is kind of minimal in my experience. So if you're more interested in drinking the beer faster and you don't want to wait around too long for the yeast to drop out, then go ahead and just use the gelatin findings technique and you'll still make a very good beer. So in a nutshell, this is what we're doing. Fermenting at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit for probably about a week or until 50% attenuated then ramping the temperature up to room temperature for a diacetyl rest, holding it at room temperature for about three days, and then cold crashing, transferring into a keg, and letting it lager at about 30 or 40 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three weeks probably, or however long it takes to become crystal clear. So as you can see, the beer turned out fairly dry just as planned, which is great. The fermentation was actually very nice uh, and quick, even at a uh, stable 50 degree lagering temperature. So I let the beer ferment out at about 50 degrees for about seven days. That was about as long as it took to get actually down to about 70% of the weight of final gravity. Uh, so that gave me the time to basically raise it up to room temperature for the diacetyl rest. I let it sit there uh, at room temperature for the remaining seven days. That's a little long for a diacetyl rest. However, that didn't really impact the beer's flavor at all. Uh, because there is indeed zero diacetyl in this beer, so it definitely worked. At that point, I actually kegged, and I rigged up a little bit of a system from my anvil bucket fermenter to be able to do a closed transfer into the keg, which is actually really beneficial for very pale beers like these. For any sort of Pilsner, you really want to do some sort of closed transfer if you can, uh, because these beers are really delicate, and they do really benefit from an oxygen-free scenario, so uh, if you can, this helps a lot. Anyway, if you are interested in how to do a closed transfer with uh, an anvil bucket style fermenter, I'm going to pop a link up here in the corner for the video that explains how that works. So once I kegged it, we started the lagering period. I brought the keyser down to very close to freezing. It's about 33 Fahrenheit or one degree Celsius. That started lagering the beer, allowing it to cold condition and clarify. Uh, and as of now, we are about three and a half weeks in the keg. So our beer at this point is actually quite clear. It's not 100% clear. Uh, it will become a lot brighter in the future. However, it is very, very close to the final product. And I'm really itching to put out a granny glass video since it's been about a month. Uh, I took a little break over the last couple of weeks here and it's actually been really good for me, but I really enjoy making content and talking about beer with you guys. So we're back into it today. So without further ado, let's go ahead and pour this German Pilsner. 
All right, so the name of the beer is It's Frankenstein. Comes in at 5.4% ABV and a whopping 45 IBUs. This beer pours a pale gold. Uh, it's actually a really nice light color. Not as light as the light lager that I showed you earlier, but it's definitely on the lighter side of the spectrum. Um, there is still a slight haze to it because it is not completely done lagering yet, but it is also rather humid outside, so that kind of causes it to not be as clear as it otherwise would look. However, it is a mostly clear beer. Also ends up having a really nice head retention on it. Uh, we have a very nice, soft, finely textured white head on it uh, that is leaving some great lacing on the edges of the glass. It's a little dark outside, so now I get some light behind this beer, you can kind of see the actual real color of it there. Um, it looks a little bit better like that, don't you think? Yeah, um, it's a really nice looking beer overall. I think it's actually a little paler than my previous German Pils, uh, which is good. One advantage that the 120 volt systems have, um, which is actually a disadvantage in most cases, is a lower boil intensity. And in beers like this, where the color and the absolute, you know, pale character of it matters a lot, uh, then that's actually kind of a benefit. Um, that being said, you don't condense the boil as much and you don't drive off DMS as much. So there is that to think about, but otherwise it does really come in quite handy for making very pale beers. So the mug that I chose is about as German as you can get, but the uh, unfortunate side of that is you don't really get much aroma out of this. So give me a second. The aroma on this is actually very subtle, but what I do get is kind of like a, a slight berry, almost. Um, it's got some of that uh, that noble hop kind of, um, I think people describe it as gooseberry, but I've never had a gooseberry before, so I don't really know what that tastes like or smells like, but I'm assuming that's what this is. Because it's not a yeast ester. But other than that, it's very, very subtle. You just get the background of Pilsner, um, which gives you kind of like a hay-like kind of note, um, but that's about it. All right, we're going for mouthfeel now. So first of all, very quaffable, very drinkable beer. So the mouthfeel on this one's actually pretty light. It's, it's very light bodied overall. Um, not really watery, but it is down there. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of those beers that just is extremely easy to drink. Um, it finished very dry, and I think that really helped it uh, in terms of its overall mouthfeel and drinkability. But there's one thing I would like to note on this. Um, now, <laughs> by the time this video is being filmed, I have actually completed my Czech Pilsner entirely. Um, and I've been drinking these two side by side, and it's actually a really cool comparison. But we'll compare them in more detail in the Czech Pills video. Uh, but one big thing I kind of wanted to actually note um, on this one in the mouthfeel is that this is a harder, more minerally kind of mouthfeel than the Czech Pills, which is arguably just soft and delicate and um, a very different thing. Uh, I'm not saying that either of those is a flaw. Um, they are indeed respective to their own styles of beer. And overall, in summary, the mouthfeel is pretty much where it should be. It's light, it's drinkable, it's a little minerally, uh, but we actually expect that, right? Because we had a little bit different of a water profile than the Czech Pilsner, which had almost nothing in the water. So with a little bit harder water, this is the kind of result that you're gonna get, but that's actually typical of the German Pilsner. All right, so now let's go in for flavor. So overall, the flavor on this one's pretty good. It's um, it's definitely German Pilsner-esque. It's got a nice snappy bitterness. It's got a really good uh, ratio of bitterness to overall malt character, and it's nice, crisp, and clean um, as a lager should be. However, there's a decent amount of noble hop flavor that is coming through, um, and this is actually really interesting. The, the other cool thing about this is uh, despite being a relatively simple beer and a relatively uncomplicated one, uh, it has a lot of complexity in it overall. So first of all, at the very beginning, we get that nice crisp bitterness that I talked about earlier, right? Uh, that's really nice, but that fades quickly. And then it moves into a surprisingly powerful amount of hop flavor, which is, um, that's different. And that's why it threw me off initially, is because I've never really tasted in quantity hop flavor from Noble Hops. 
um, and it's different. It's like a fruity berry kind of flavor um, that you would never get from yeast. And it also has a little bit of like this peppery spice to it. This is actually pretty cool. That being said, it's a bit strong for my tastes. Um, and it kind of really throws the balance of the beer towards the hops. Um, however, once that fades, which is quick because the beer is so dry, uh, it actually goes into a really nice uh, evolution of malt flavors. Uh, the Vireman Pilsner, as you know, is one of my favorites. It just is a very nice crackery um, and kind of white bread flavor um, for, a, for a Pilsner malt, but it also has a little bit of a toastiness to it. Um, there's almost like a little crust, like bread crust toast, very slight toast in there that gives it um, a little extra layer of, of interesting complexity. And then on top of that, we get a little bit of a honey note as well. Uh, just Pills kind of tends to do that for some reason. It just has this like false sense of honey sweetness. Um, and I'm not exactly sure how that works, but um, it is actually really nice in this particular beer. Anyway, I just crushed the half liter, so it's time to go get some more. There we go, that's a little bit better shot of the head on this beer uh, than when I initially gave you. It's pretty nice uh, fluffiness, right? I'm pretty happy about that. So overall, this really does check that box for most parts of the German Pilsner. Um, it's bitter, it's dry, it has still that same excellent drinkability. It's got delicate flavor and, um, and definitely a decent amount of complexity compared to other pale lagers on the market. One thing that I'm pleased to note is that there is no detectable DMS in this. Like conventional wisdom says that uh, you need a 90 minute boil to drive off DMS, but also modern techniques and modern malting seem to kind of indicate that that's not really an actual issue. Uh, that being said, I've had it in my beers before, depending on the type of malt used and the length of the boil, it kind of seems to be a crapshoot. So uh, I did roll the dice a bit with the 60 minute boil. I've never really gotten DMS from Vireman Pilsner malt before, so that should tell you everything you need to know. The one thing I am really not a huge fan of in this is actually the Noble Hop flavor um, of all things. It is peculiar. Initially, I thought it was an off flavor. Initially, I thought it was acetaldehyde, uh, which is in pretty much every single beer if you taste it young. Uh, that's that kind of green apple peel flavor that you get. It actually ends up going away after a little conditioning time and it's really nothing to worry about. After a couple weeks of conditioning time, I tasted this beer again and the flavor of acetaldehyde was not there anymore. But there was still a little bit of a fruitiness there and I wasn't sure what was going on, so Kind of let it sit for a bit longer. Let it cold condition now at this point. Figured that it was maybe a yeast byproduct. Nope, not that kind of berry flavor either. This is a completely different berry flavor um, than I've ever really uh, experienced. And after doing a decent amount of research on the internet, I figured out that this is actually noble hop flavor. No one really ever uses Tetnog and Halatau in a flavor uh, usage. Typically, you'll always see them used for aroma and bittering sometimes, um, but really mostly for aroma because they have this really cool, very delicate uh, herbal spicy aroma that everyone loves and it's classic quintessential European beer aroma, which this beer definitely does have. What you typically don't see is a flavor thing. And when I chucked half an ounce of each hop into the boil at 15 minutes, I didn't realize that I'd actually be adding a lot of flavor into this beer, um, which doesn't really, at least for my palate, work for this type of beer. I really think it is a balanced thing because it ends up basically being a little too much kind of that gooseberry flavor, I guess, um, throwing the overall character of the beer out of whack. So you get a decent slap of bitterness, as you should with a German Pilsner, but then it ends up being kind of like this fruity berry character, which then fades into clean and crisp and, you know, the expected malt experience that you would get. So it kind of makes it weird. And that's probably the biggest complaint I have about the beer. Obviously it could stand to clarify up a little bit more, but it's not bad the way it is. It's about 90% clear. It's not a yeast derived flavor. In my experience, the esters of lager yeast tend to be uh, very banana heavy. Uh, it's a very different flavor. So um, I really was thinking it was a yeast problem. Um, and like I said, I thought it was acetaldehyde at first as well, uh, but the acetaldehyde that I was actually tasting ended up fading over time, so that was gone. Uh, and this is a different type of 
kind of fruit character. With the exception of that one thing, which is actually entirely personal preference, um, this is actually a pretty decent Pilsner. Uh, and I'm really excited to see how it continues to mature and age and develop over time, uh, as I am really enjoying it overall for what it is. For potential improvements on this one, if you're really scared of DMS, which uh, it's understandable and it's totally fine, if you wanna just do a 90 minute boil, go for it. Nothing wrong with that. Otherwise, for any other potential improvements on this one, I would have just cut the 15 minute hop edition in half and taken that extra half ounce of hops and thrown that into the zero minute or the aroma uh, category. That way I would have taken more advantage of the Noble Hops aroma character instead of just going all flavor with them and <laughs> ending up with a slightly different beer than I intended on. There's also the water profile piece of this. If you want a little less hop character, a little less bitterness, um, to just bring that water profile back down to a more balanced uh, kind of profile instead of going so heavy on the sulfates like I did, um, and you'll have slightly more balanced results. I really enjoyed this brew and I'm really looking forward to the rest of this series. As I'm filming this video, the Czech Pilsner is actually already done. The final pieces of that video are actually going to be filmed shortly and it's an actually outstanding lager. It is a probably one of my best beers in a long time. That particular beer really did end up blowing my mind a little bit, and this one kind of sits in its shadow a little bit. Keep in mind that also may be influencing my overall perception of this beer. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. Anyway, if you learned something, please like the video. And if you want to see more stuff like this, hit that subscribe button. If you want to support the channel, please go ahead and check out the merch store in the description box. As you can see, I got a new t-shirt now, which is the 10 Commandments of Home Brewing. Anyway, over the next several videos, we'll be working on commandment number nine, which is thou shalt not call Pilsners boring. And uh, I'm going to do a pretty good job of hopefully making that apparent. Anyway, I've got a large lineup of merchandise available in that store if you want to go check that stuff out. Pine glasses, t-shirts, hats, tank tops, uh, you name it. Other ways to support the channel, also in the description box you'll find a uh, list of links to my favorite and recommended homebrewing equipment. So check those out if you happen to be in the market for it. Otherwise, I also have a Patreon if you're interested in supporting me on a more personal level as well. All of it is sincerely appreciated and uh, it does mean a whole ton to me that you guys support me and enjoy what I'm doing here. Uh, and I have full intention of keeping it up. So thank you very, very much. Anyway, if you're interested in following me on more platforms than just YouTube, go ahead and check out Instagram. I'm on Instagram and Instagram only as The Apartment Brewer, and there I'll post a little bit more frequently. Anyway, if you've made it this far into the video, you guys are my absolute true fans, and you guys matter the most, and I really appreciate you guys watching all the way to the end, so cheers to you. I will catch you guys in the next one, so until then, cheers.